Hi, I'm Marty McKenzie with His Love Ministries. Welcome to the Least of These Podcasts. We reach out to those the world has forgotten. If you'd like to know more about us and how you can donate to help us fulfill our mission, go to hisloveministries.net. Thank you very much and God bless you. John chapter 18. Remember the whole purpose of the book. Chapter 20, verse 20 and 21, where John says that many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, but these have been written about that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and believing you might have life in his name. And so we've seen the supremacy of Jesus and that he came from heaven and he put on human flesh and and then we saw how he's uh, spent all these years training his disciples and working with them and and uh, then he goes down that road to Jerusalem and and they he's riding on that donkey and the people are saying here comes the king here comes the king and Jesus weeps and mourns because they don't understand that he came to die on the cross, that he came to die for their sins. And, and at that point, some Greeks come and say, we want to see this Jesus. And, and at that point, Jesus turns from the Jews and says, my hour is at hand. And then he spends all that time in the upper room in chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, and 17, and he and he spends all that time in the upper room telling the disciples all these things that are going to happen and that the Lord's going to send the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of Christ. And when he comes, he'll guide them into all truth. And then when we get to chapter 18, Judas has went out and it was night and the devil entered into him and, and he has turned on Jesus and he, he and all these troops come. We don't know how many, but when the guys come and the first 11 verses was where we were at the last time, they bring in a troop and it could have been as many as 1,200 people. And that's an awful lot to arrest one person, isn't it? But then they had the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and the officers, and they had all these people coming to arrest Jesus. And remember Jesus, they said, who are you seeking? And Jesus says, I am he. They say, Jesus, he said, I am. And he knocks them all down, and then they get back up again, and he asks, who are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And then they say, he said, I am he, and if you're looking for me, let these go, that the scripture might be fulfilled, that none of his disciples, none of them was lost. Remember, during that time, what does Peter do? He pulls out his sword, and he whacks off old Malchus's ear, and apparently Jesus doesn't say he stooped down, picked up his ear, and put it back on. It says he just touched his ear. Apparently he made him a brand new ear. and Just whatever was taken off, he fixed. There was no cuts, no anything. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given to me? Remember he's talking about the fact that he's going to the cross. He has to die for our sins, and that's the cup. Peter is is uh, not trusting in Jesus, and Jesus is trusting in the Father. And one person entitled this next section, Jesus' Trial and Peter's Denial. Because then when we look in verses 12 through 26, we're going to kind of see how Jesus, one minute they talk about Jesus. You know when you read a good book, what, what do they do to you a lot of times? Or a TV show? They'll show one set of characters for a little bit, Right? And then they get you to a part where well, it's exciting and all of a sudden, what do they do? They jump over to somebody else, don't they? And then you got to wait another chapter or two or a little while longer to get to back to where they were at to find out what happened, right? So they keep you in suspense. 
And uh, that's kind of what happens here. But they're going to contrast Peter and Jesus because Jesus is doing what he's supposed to do. He's trusting in the Father. He's going to the cross. He knows that he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. And Peter, he is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And uh, we'll find out that later. That, that you remember back in, I think, I remember what chapter it is, Matthew chapter 16. I'll find it in a minute. But remember when Jesus is in the garden and, and he's praying and he goes three times and he tells the disciples, pray lest you enter into temptation. And every time he comes back, they're asleep, right? And then he finally speaks to Peter and says, Peter, could you not? Just bear with me in prayer for one short period of time. He says, you know, because he'd already told him that Satan desired to sift him as wheat. And then when he turned back, to go and strengthen the disciples. So in other words, he already predicted that Peter was going to deny him three times before the cock crows. Uh, three times he's going to deny him. Peter didn't pray. He wasn't ready when the temptation come, and we're going to see he's already cut off the ear of Malchus because he wasn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. He wasn't prayed up, and so he's already done one thing wrong, and now we're going to see how he denies Jesus and how Jesus stands up like he's supposed to be doing. So Jesus comes forward when these people are not expecting him to, and so what does it say in verse 12? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and they bound him. So the bottom line is, is this fulfills Isaiah 53 verse 7 where it says that he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, that he was bound. And, you know, when they would take those lambs, what they would do in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice them. They would literally tie them to the altar when they killed him and when they sacrificed him. And you remember John said back in chapter 1, verse 29, that behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, right? And so he's being led as the Lamb to the slaughter and then begins six illegal trials. I have something here that Chuck Swindoll did. And really what they did was six illegal trials. And I'll, I'll maybe talk about that as we go. But, but first of all, he, he, every time he's tried, all of these trials are illegal. Every single one of them. They're held at night. They make these false accusations. They don't have any witnesses. There's prejudice. There's violence. They switch the accusations. They don't allow anybody to uh, really tell the truth like they're supposed to do. They say, has anybody got a witness? And finally they get two guys that they can't verify the story. And then they vote at night and see the Sanhedrin. They were never supposed to have trials at night. And what they were supposed to do is if they had a trial the day before, they were supposed to wait till the next day before they actually voted whether somebody was guilty or not. But see, they didn't have the right to kill anybody because the Romans, remember, in authority over the Jews. And so the Romans had taken the authority away from the Jews to stone people to do these things. So the Jews had to concoct a new story. So they changed the story to say that Jesus is guilty of treason, that he's guilty of trying to be king over all of Rome, right? And so they keep him under false arrest even though he's found innocent by the uh, Jews really or the Romans because they have no real charges he has no defense attorney they they slap him they beat on him when he goes to another guy they mock him he has no defense attorney and then finally without proof Pilate allows him to be crucified and an innocent man to be condemned. So we'll talk about those in a little more detail as we get to them. But that's kind of the summary. And every one of those trials were illegal. There was three Roman trials and three 
Jewish trials. The three Jewish trials happened first, and then the three Roman trials. You ever notice, we've talked about this before, how many times the number three happens in the scripture. And it's amazing, and I think, you know, it's that completeness. They bound him, and let's get to verse 13, and then it says they led him away to Annas first. Now, Annas, at this point, this is some information that's not given in any of the other Gospels, but at this point, what they're going to talk about is it says they led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now, they tell you that because, first of all, let's understand something. What happened during this time is the Romans, they didn't want anybody to have too much power. And so what they did is they turned this high priest office. Remember that, that uh, the person who was high priest was supposed to be high priest for their lifetime, according to Jewish law. Now, Annas was really the high priest and he should have been for all of his life. But when Rome came over, they took over and what they did was they kind of took that spot away from Annas. And what they did is it kind of became one of those, uh, what do you call it, a political plum, one of those things, it was a bought office. What happened was, the bottom line was, was Annas, he was really the one who was still in control and in the minds of the Jews, the reason they took Jesus to Annas was cause he was really, according to Jewish law, he was really still the high priest. And so they took him to Annas first, but he still held all the power because he was a rich man. He was the one who kept buying that office. And he kept putting his son-in-law and all of his sons and his grandsons and all these family members. He had five or six family members in a row that were actually the high priest. And he kept buying the office. He was kind of like the man behind the man. And he was always in control because he had somebody in his family. And his son-in-law, his son-in-law Caiaphas, was the one who was high priest that year. So really, he's still kind of in control. And so the Jews take him to Annas first, uh, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And then he goes on to say that Caiaphas was the one that advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Remember back in chapter 11, verse 49, it says, And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So God used Caiaphas and he put his own words in Caiaphas' mouth. Even though Caiaphas wasn't a, a saved man, even though he wasn't a godly man, he was the high priest according to the Romans, but he was not God's man but God put his words in his mouth. And so that he wants us to know that Caiaphas is the one who prophesied and said that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Let's look at verse 15. He says, and Simon Peter, now notice he says Simon Peter. You know, every time he says Simon, what happens? It's usually talking about Peter going back to his old ways, right? <laughs> he says, Simon Peter. Remember that word Simon means uh, shaky one, vacillator. In other words, you know, he was the guy that was, you know, if the wind blew this way, he was going to go that way. And the wind blew this way, he was going that way, right? But he was always wanting to do the right thing, but he was always following people. But Jesus says, you're the shaky one. You're the follower, but one day, but one, but your name shall be Peter and you're going to be a rock. Now, Peter hadn't quite made it yet. And that's the way God does it, is it takes time to change us into the people that God wants us to be. And so what happens here is, he says, and Simon Peter followed Jesus. Now, you know what? He should have never followed Jesus, should he? Never should have followed Jesus. 
Because see, Jesus had already gotten all the disciples out of trouble, had kept them clear because he said, if you only got, a, you know, when you got an arrest warrant, he said, who are you seeking? And he says, let these go if, you, if you're seeking me, right? So if you got an arrest warrant, you can only arrest the person that you're arresting, right? And so Jesus says, you're looking for me. Let these people go. And so Jesus gives them an out for them to get away, to stay away. But Peter, he just can't do it. He's still, I think, kind of self-confident. And he's, you know, still thinking, I'm going to rescue Jesus. And he's already tried to cut the high priest's head off and he missed and got his ear. And so Peter's following along. And then it says, and so did another disciple. Now, we don't know who that other disciple is. It was probably John. Could have been Joseph of Arimathea or uh, Nicodemus. Could have been one of those. But we don't know. But it says here that the disciple was known to the high priest. And he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But they believe that his family, actually because he was the cousin of... Uh, his mother was the cousin of Mary, that they probably were Levites. And so they had, they were part of that Le Levitical family. And remember, the Levites were what? Priests. And so the priest, he, he could have had access to this group of people because of him being a Levite. And so we don't know for sure, but it's probably who it was. And the reason we think that he says the other disciples, how's G John always referred to himself a lot of times, is the other disciple. When they ran to the tomb, there was another disciple, right? Or he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And so he goes and he, he, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest because he goes into a further level. But Peter stood at the door outside. And, and this is the beginning of the, the demise of Peter. Because he says, Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. John or whoever it is, probably John goes and speaks to the, the girl that's keeping the door. And I wasn't aware that a girl should have been keeping the door. But remember behind all of this stuff, remember that one thing, what happened when Jesus went and cleared out the temple? The reason the Jews wanted to get rid of Jesus was what? They were making plenty of money, right? I mean, Annas and Caiaphas, remember they were ripping the people off in the temple and Jesus has cleared out the temple at least twice, turned over the money changers table and let loose the animals and all these things and, and what these people were doing is every time they would come to come to uh, sacrifice, what happens? They say, your animal's no good, or your money's no good. And they jack up the price of the money, and they sell them money at this high price, or they sell them an animal at a high price. And so every time the Jews come to sacrifice, they have turned literally God's temple into a high-priced uh, money exchange place. They're, they're probably charging 10 to 50 times the amount of what they're supposed to be charging. If they change money, you can't use Roman money. you got to reuse the Jewish money. If, you, if, if you've got an animal and it's got a spot on it, and guess what? They would find something wrong with every animal. They didn't care how pure. Remember, the animals couldn't have one spot, one blemish, but they would find a spot on every animal. They said, this animal's no good. you got to buy one of our animals. And they would sell one of their animals. Of course, they jacked up the price, right? So Jesus has come in and he's destroying the business of the high priest because they're controlling the temple. They're literally getting rich off of the temple because they're selling these animals. They're selling the money at a high exchange rate. And that's why these people hate Jesus so bad. That's part of it. There's this woman standing at the door, a servant girl. And she says, you are not... Also, one of these, this man's disciples, are you? And when she says this, she's really expecting a negative answer. She's, she's expecting a negative answer. 
because of the way she praises. You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And you can kind of hear the contempt in her verse. You are not also one of his disciples, are you? You're not with him, are you? And Peter says, I am not. There's denial number one. Now the servants and the officers who had made the fire of coals stood there, for it was cold and they warmed themselves. And Peter did what? Stood with them and warmed himself. Y'all remember what it says over there in, in the book of Psalms, the first chapter? And, it, and we're going to see that Peter gets worse and worse and worse. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. What is Peter doing? He's standing at the fire, warming himself with the very people who are trying to kill his Savior and his Master. He is standing with these sinners at the fire. And we'll see before it's over with, Luke also says that he sits down with them at the fire. In Luke 22, he says that Peter sits. And the Bible says, you know, don't walk with them, don't stand with them, don't sit with them. There's a progression that when you walk with them, you know, you're, you're kind of walking and talking. And then when you stand with them, they become your friends. And then when you sit down with them, then you're really in trouble because you're consorting with them and they've all, y'all have all become good buddies at that point. Well, Peter is headed down that road. Even though he's not thinking about that, he is well on the way to denying Jesus and hanging out with the people who are going to kill the Savior of the world. And so it says, there was a fire of coals. It was cold and they warmed themselves. So this tells you that the person that wrote that was an actual eyewitness too, right? And then the high priest asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. First of all, he asked about his disciples. He's probably wanting to know about how many people Jesus has. He's trying to figure out how much opposition he's going to have. How many people are going to stand with Jesus against him. And then he also asked about his doctrine. He wants to know what Jesus is teaching. And then Jesus speaks to him and says, I spoke openly to the world, verse 20. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. In other words, Jesus is saying, this, the way this guy phrases it, it's sort of like Jesus is doing all this secret stuff. Well, everything Jesus said, he always did out in the open, right? Everybody could hear him. Everybody knew what was going on. Now, yes, there were times he privately taught his disciples, right? But he wasn't teaching them anything contrary to what he was teaching everybody else. And so this guy is acting like he's got some kind of secret cult, some kind of secret <laughs> group of people who are trying to secretly uh, do something against the Jewish people. And so what does Jesus do? He doesn't just sit there and take it. He says, look, I've always spoken openly. I've taught in the synagogues and the temple where the Jews always meet and in secret I have said nothing. And then he says, well, why do you ask me? Why does he say that? Because the Bible says in Exodus, at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. Jesus is saying here, this is an illegal trial. You're accusing me unjustly. Where are your witnesses? That's what he's saying. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. In other words, go find some witnesses. Do what you're supposed to do. This is an illegal trial. And so Jesus is attacking. He's not just sitting there. And when he had said these things, verse 22... One of the officers stood by, who stood by, struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? So basically he says, Do you hit do you speak to the high priest like that? He just hits him with his rough, open-handed blow with the palm and hits him pretty roughly. 
Remember that, that Matthew talks about when you're hit on one cheek, you turn the other cheek, and, and Jesus spoke back to him. They said, well, why didn't, he, why, didn't, why didn't he turn the other cheek? Well, he did. He went all the way to the cross, didn't he? Because that was the plan. But Jesus answered him and said, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. There it is again. Bear witness of the evil. Where are your witnesses? But if well, why do you strike me? They are illegally striking him. They are brutally treating him. They have bound him illegally. They have arrested him illegally. And then it says, Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now they probably lived in the same house. And usually there was a house and they had a place inside of it where the Sanhedrin would meet. Y'all remember who the Sanhedrin were? They were a group of about 70 people of the scribes, Pharisees, and the Sadducees. And they would meet and they would, it was like a court of law. And they would determine if somebody was guilty or what was right or what was wrong. He probably went into that room with Caiaphas and notice what does it say? They sent him bound. He's still illegally bound because guess what? He's accused, but he's not been found guilty, right? And so now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, verse 25, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it again and said, I am not. Here we are. He's standing still and he's warming himself by the fire. Like I said, Luke says in Luke 22 that he's also sitting next to the fire. He says, I am not. And then one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And then Peter then denied him again and immediately a rooster crowed. Let's talk about that a minute. What happens here? Now, if you read the rest of the Gospels, remember when you read the Gospels, sometimes people will say, well, your Bible's not true. Because in one place it says a servant girl, in one place it says a man, in another it says this. And remember, if we were all standing there and we saw something happen, and we asked 10 of us, we'd probably get 10 different stories, right? There'd be some similarities, a lot of similarities, but we would, we would, we might see the girl. And what probably happened is one person asked, and then everybody else kind of chimed in. And so each person kind of said, well, this person or that person. And so there's a whole group of people. You imagine standing there in the crowd, and they, they don't like Jesus, and all of a sudden somebody says something, and everybody else does what? They all chime in, right? Are you with him? Or were you with him? And, and, and you weren't the one, were you? But in this last question, the first two questions, they expected a negative answer. But this guy, he, he, he's uh, kin to the guy, Malchus, and he says, did I not see you in the garden? He's expecting a positive answer. That He said, I saw you. You're the one. And then Peter denies again, and immediately a rooster crows. So three times Jesus, uh, Peter has denied Jesus. And finally the rooster crows. And we know if we remember the rest of the Gospels what happens at that moment. Jesus turns and looks at Peter straight in the face. And Peter knows at that moment when he hears that crow, that rooster crow and that Jesus looks at him, he knows he's done wrong. But you know what, folks? Let's think about this. You know, Peter was a great and mighty man. You know that. I mean, everybody beats up on Peter, right? But you know what? You know who Peter was? I've said this before. Peter was the leader of all the disciples. If you will read the gospel accounts, every time you will see the disciples' name, you will see three groups of four named, and you will always see... Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And it'll say a lot of times, Peter first. And what they're saying is Peter is the leader. And so even though Peter got in trouble a lot, 
You know, if you're the leader, you get in trouble a lot, right? Because <laughs> you're always trying to do something. And, and so Peter was the leader. Peter got in trouble a lot, but the reason he got in trouble was because he was always trying to do what Jesus wanted him to do, and he always thought he had to do a little bit better, and he would follow Jesus anywhere, and I really believe he wanted to. But Peter gives us some things, kind of give us some examples, some lessons. So Matthew 26, 41, this is where Jesus has said, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The first thing we need to remember is we need to be prayed up, right? Because the devil's always roaming about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the Bible tells us in, in uh, Ephesians 6, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he says, stand, and then stand therefore, withstand, and having done all, to stand. In other words, what happens there is the Bible says that Jesus has won the victory, right? But what do we need to do? We need to be willing to stand on our principles, right? Or as we sing the old song, maybe that'll be a good one to finish up the day with, standing on the promises, right? We stand on those promises no matter what the world and the devil throws at us. And Peter, he was not ready because he was not prayed up. He was, pre he was sleeping when he should have been praying. He should have been praying or else none of this stuff would have happened. Because Jesus said, look, the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing. And so if you live too close to the world, guess what? You're going to get burned by the world. And so he should have followed Jesus' counsel. First of all, he should have been praying. Second of all, he should have followed Jesus' counsel and left. Instead, he goes and denies Jesus three times. And like I said, Luke records that Peter sat down at the fire with the wicked. Luke 22, verse 55, Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And you know, folks, this could happen to any of us, no matter how strong we are in the Lord. And that's the second lesson. No one is immune to failure. Nobody. Not me, not anybody. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. But what does he say in the next verse? There is no temptation such as the common to man, but God, who is faithful, will allow the way of escape. If you're trusting God, you're standing on the promises and you're prayed up and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you don't have to fall. You don't have to fail. But nobody's immune to failure. And then lastly, this section shows the glory of God and the sinfulness of man. Because you know what? Everybody in here, every one of us, is capable of messing up. <laughs> I tell the guys in the jail sometimes, I tell them, you know, but by the grace of God, here go I. I could do one stupid thing and I could be right there with them, right? Now, most people don't think that. And, and you know, and, and that's their problem. Because if you're not thinking that you can get in trouble, you can do something wrong, you better take heed lest you fall. And so remember, folks, nobody's immune to failure. There's a reason God gave us prayer. And he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the schemes of the devil, right? He said, put on the, the, the gospel of peace and the, the shoes of peace and the, the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the Spirit, and, and all these things, put them on that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. Because he is roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. And what, is the, what, what does the lion look for? Weak people, right? He looks for weak animals, and that's what the devil's looking for. When we're weak, when we're lonely, when we're tempted, when we're by ourselves and we're not prayed up and all these things, we can fall. We can fail. But just remember, even if we do, even if we do fail, God can restore us too, can He? He restored Peter. Three times Peter denied Him. 
three times, Jesus restored him. But let's not get to that place. Peter, Peter had a load on his shoulders because God knew, knew what he was capable of. He said that you'll be a rock. And uh, remember Peter's the guy, that, that same guy that scared of the servant girl. What does he do after he stands up on the day of Pentecost and preaches, you men who crucified Jesus, the Savior of the world, and he gets in their face that day because why? He's got the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's living in the power of the Spirit, and he's got that holy boldness. And 3,000 people are saved. And if you look at the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, who's the man? Peter. Until Paul comes along and starting in chapter 9, Peter's the man. Peter's the one who's building the church, who God is using to preach and to teach and to lead the church movement. And then when you get to about chapter 12, Paul comes in and takes over. But Peter is mightily used of God. Don't ever forget that. I mean, we always hear people beat Peter up. But just remember, God uses any of us. And look at all the failings and all the things Peter had that he messed up. But God still used him. And that means that he can use any of us, right? Because all of us are frail and have failures and mess up. But God can use every one of us if we're just willing and available. And that was the thing that Peter was, he was willing and available. So let's close in prayer and then we'll sing, um, I think it's number 50, Standing on the Promises. Father, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy and love. We thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross. We thank you that uh, even though we are, none of us immune to failure, you said that, that there is no temptation such as common to man, but with the temptation, you will give us the way out. So, Lord, we don't have to fall. We don't have to fail. But if we do, you also said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins... You're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to forgive us from all unrighteousness and to keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you that we have an advocate with the Father, that Jesus is sitting at the right hand and he is the one who made the way for us to be who we are. Lord, help us to stand strong for you and to stand on those promises no matter what the world tells us. No matter what the devil tells us and throws at us, help us to keep on keeping on and to be like Peter and our Paul who said, I fought the good fight and I finished the race. Help us to finish well, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Marty McKenzie with His Love Ministries. Please help us reach out to those the world has forgotten. Everyone we minister to is locked up in some way, shape, or form. Those in the nursing home facilities are locked up in bodies that do not work in a wheelchair or in a bed. We minister to children and youth who are locked up because of behavioral problems. Some have told us we want to have a real family because their parents have lost or given up custody of them. Other kids are locked up because they've committed crimes. We also minister to those locked up at the jails and the prisons, to those locked up in addictions, to drugs, alcohol, depression, and suicidal thoughts, to those locked up in a variety of other things that keep them from becoming who Jesus wants them to be. He came to give us abundant life, joy, and set us free, and these people that we minister to are not free. Our desire is to show them whatever their background, no matter what they've done, to see how much God loves them. We seek to help them receive forgiveness and freedom from their sin in Jesus Christ. We minister in the local area of Savannah, Georgia, and surrounding Effingham and Chatham area. We have recently expanded our ministry to the Lexington and Columbia, South Carolina area. We do over 2,000 services every year. We hope and pray that you will support us in some way that so we can continue our mission. Go to hisloveministries.net and click on the Donate Now button or send it via regular mail to Post Office Box 1881, Lexington, South Carolina, 29071. We hope and pray that you will do that. Thank you and God bless you. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. John 832.